Okay, cool. So you fly out on the helicopter in this group, and then, uh, and then what happens? I guess. So what did what happens at that point at the site? Well, I can't necessarily talk about that, but let's just say mm -hmm. um, I was able to see things with my own eyes that would basically make people understand that everything crucial to this world is not topside; it is underground. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And unfortunately, when uh, the purpose of that facility is to actually take down ET craft, okay. and they do this about two to three times a year. Oh, well, that's amazing. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. I told him that every single person I knew who knew about what he had seen had not lived to tell this story. Thank you and welcome to Michael Herrera. Welcome to the show, everyone. Amazing interview here, unbelievable. I know a lot of people have negative feelings towards Dr. Greer, but if you can just imagine standing up 12 June and saying the things that Michael Herrera says here, this is back in 12 June of 2023, this past summer, he gets linked with an insider who claims to be a high position, some sort of leader in this organization that actually captures UAP craft. They shoot him down. It's just an unbelievable story. I'd like to play a short clip to introduce Michael. This is from Stephen Greer's disclosure event. And then we'll get right into the interview. Thanks for being here. We were attached to the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, which conducts maritime operations all throughout Southeast Asia in conjunction with the 7th Naval Fleet, which houses one uh, landing helo deck or LHD among LPDs, which is what I was on, called a uh, USS Denver. Ironically, that's where I'm from, so kind of felt like home. Now, um, during that operation in Ketsana in the Philippines, they had actually heard that a tsunami and earthquake hit the western part of Sumatra, which is western Indonesia, uh, Padang City more specifically. Out of all the ships in the 7th Fleet, the ship I was on was the only one that was routed to that location. So um, this happened September 30th. We we're briefed that there is some of President Obama's family members that are present on either in the city or somewhere near there. They had a SEAL platoon that was ready to go to retrieve those people. We were then briefed that we were going to be armed during this operation. So um, they ended up selecting certain Marines to go ahead and do this. We were only in sticks of uh, six, six Marines, so it had uh, NCOs on top of uh, other Marines to help with that. So they, we again boarded uh, CH-53 Super Stallions, which are gigantic helicopters that are roughly 100 feet long. Uh, I love the design of them. It's my personal favorite. Um, but we ended up boarding this on the ship, and we flew to the south western part of the city, which is Padang. We got off the bird, and what we were instructed to do at that point through the briefing was to push to a high ground at least to get better observation. We trekked up about 300 meters. When we got to this high point, I was taking video camera, and I had actually turned to the north, which just kind of slopes down. And right there was something that stuck out like a sore thumb, especially with jungle terrain, things like that. It's always going to be basically imprisoned in my mind for the rest of my life, and it has been for 14 years, was something that was rotating, and it was transitioning between colors like a light uh, matte gray as well as a dark matte black. So in between, that's what it kept, and it was very smooth. We had uh, all looked at each other as we got online, and we decided to investigate. Once we got down this slope, we were approximately 150 meters away from this craft. Okay, welcome to Lado Files. I am here with Michael Herrera. Mike Herrera, he has an amazing story from Indonesia 2009, where he actually saw a very large, a very large UFO. And that is not the end of the story. So he has a new source, basically an insider source, releasing information that trusts Mike. And the story is just amazing. So thanks for your time, Mike. Thanks for being here. Hey, thank you for allowing me to come on. Okay, we were chatting a little bit before as, um, you know, why are you speaking out? You know, wh what's your goal in this? Well, um, I mean, obviously with the illegal secrecy behind things that, you know, exist on this nature. I mean, if you were to ask me 
prior to my experience, whether that stuff actually existed, I would actually say that you're probably nuts. I didn't believe in any of that stuff. So I think it's more of a sense also to get people to understand that this stuff is very real. This stuff is very, very complicated and it's very well um, woven into our government, into everyday life, so to speak. And as far as them trying to keep it secret. The other thing, as far as learning all of this, um, going through this journey too, is the world that we could potentially have if the technology was to have been uh, mass produced to the public, instead of just keeping it for an illegal secret organization that all they do is use it for nefarious purposes and just to further their own agendas. You know, um, there's a lot of breakthroughs that could happen. And that's not just um, transportation wise, but we're talking about medical, we're talking about the economy, we're talking about technology with power. Um, poverty would basically end overnight. You know, so I think getting this information out is also pulling other people who've had experiences, maybe similar to this, also the fact that people directly involved running these operations, so to speak, to also come forward to get them at least to talk to the right people. So I think what a lot of people in the back end are now starting to understand, and this is what I've been briefed with a lot of Senate Intelligence Committee um, even some uh, members of special intelligence service who actually oversee all the letter agencies is the compartmentalization of what they thought existed on their end is much more complex with these organizations. So getting this information to them, all of a sudden it's connecting all the dots. From my testimony, Grushes, many of the 40 to 50 plus other whistleblowers, all of our stuff is connecting. There's stuff that I've exposed that's also making sense for other people uh, of how, why this would happen or how it could happen um, or what the examples that have given at least uh, some of the documentation which you're going to provide to some of the people at least with this book um, how that connects the dots and how these people are retrieved and how they ultimately uh, reverse engineer the crap or even use the technology to begin with okay and you mentioned there yeah that um, they contacted you essentially and and that's really because of what I saw you first was on your 12 June uh, disclosure with Dr. Greer. Basically, Correct. I saw that. So yeah, you were there in in Washington, um, and you told this story. I believe was that the first time you told the story uh, publicly. Yes. Um, prior to that, April 27th is when I had my meeting with the Pentagon uh, Special Intelligence Service as well as a special. Uh, Senate Intelligence Committee and um, with numerous other people, including some senators and congressmen that I can't give names to just because of the NDAs that I've signed. Um, just to keep them protected for one and two, I mean, I, I, I understand where they're coming from, but at the same sense, that's kind of where this started. Um, my personal opinion at that time was I didn't think they were gonna take this serious. And once the sources in these operations came forward, on the back end of things and corroborated what I saw, what, except for they're the ones running the operations. So they explained further in detail for what I saw and what the purpose of it was and why and how they do it. So that was kind of, um, how do I put it? Um, that kind of ruined their day, so to speak, because, you know, again, it's kind of, it's not necessarily a pleasant thing to talk about. It's not something that's cool. It's not something, I mean, it's, it's, it's very real stuff. People are losing their lives from this, whether it's voluntary or not. You know, um, there's other means that, you know, it, and it's just from what they've explained to me, there's also a darker side of it that I may not know, which actually may have things that involve human trafficking and things like that. Because what, what would stop them? If our conventional military and government can't stop them because their technology is thousands of years more advanced compared to our most sophisticated aircraft, What's going to stop them? Nothing. They're going to keep pressing forward with it, make as much money as they want to, bend the rules, break the laws, because there's nothing holding them accountable. So ultimately, going through this journey, um, getting some accountability there, I think is definitely going to help because then you're going to have other things on the back end transpire to that too with accountability. Okay, and let's let's start, I guess, with um, the actual craft. You know, this is from. Uh, Reddit. So Joey is not my name. Okay. So Joey is not my name. He actually contacted me 
Uh, and Joey's not my name. Um, I verified his, his real identity. And he has actually been spending a ton of, of time on Reddit looking into your case. So before he, mm -hmm. he contacted you, I understood he did get in contact with you to ask many of these questions. Um, but yes, he has he gone did. through a very exhaustive um, list here. And so my first question, just because we have this graphic up here, is 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 this what you remember that craft looking like? I know it was from 2009, but what, what is your recollection of the actual craft itself that you saw in Indonesia? It's it's pretty accurate. Um, you know, there's obviously the distance that we were at. You're not going to really see the fine details up as you, if you were to see it up close, right? So as far as from a distance, yes, that looks very accurate to what I saw. Okay. And then there's been some questions on the actual, the color and the material and the, uh, it would change basically. Um, yes. Can you go into any Don't. further detail on that? Because we that has come yes. up in other cases as well. Yeah. Right. So the whole the whole craft itself was changing colors. It wasn't just like specific parts okay. of it or anything. The whole craft was. And it was going from a light matte gray to a dark matte black. So if you were to like, the only way I can say how it was changing is if you had one of those light switches that you can move up and down instead of just the flips, right? You can gradually set the setting of how bright you want it manually. That's almost like you're kind of going like this. That's what it was like. It was, it was almost like a pulsating color is the only way I can describe that. Except obviously going from light matte gray to dark matte black. Okay, and then yeah, basically you sized it based off of the CH fifty three. Um, Correct. Uh, because, yep, because uh, usually um, a CH fifty three is going to be roughly a hundred feet in length from nose to tail, and uh, this thing, I mean, at the distance we were, I mean, you as as a marine, you get pretty good at judging distances just because of how to employ your weapon systems. So. Judging the distance with this craft, where we were at, the trees, I mean, everything that distance, you can pretty much kind of gauge it. And that's how I was able to at least kind of roughly estimate that you could fit at least from nose to tail of three of those CH-53s right underneath it, which would equate to around 300 feet. Okay. And I've covered uh, a lot of this on my channel before. You can, if, if uh, anyone in the audience wants to watch that, it, it's called Black Ops. So there'll be a link in the description you can check out uh, the full video here. So this was after the earthquake in Sumatra, right, in 2009. Is, From what I understand, it was nine or 10 days after the actual earthquake? Yes. Um, so September timeframe um, is when the actual earthquake happened, I believe September 30th, if I'm not mistaken. And then obviously we were dealing with humanitarian assistance out in the Philippines originally first, and my ship was the only one that was routed to go to the western side of the dang city, at least on the western side of... Uh, um, Indonesia, or what Sumatra would be, um, the city at least where we were nearby was uh, um, Padang. So we were the only ship there, um, which was kind of odd, but I mean, it's the Navy, it's the Marine Corps. At that time, I wasn't, you know, very well versed in how things work in the military. So it may have been odd to me, but to them, there's perfectly logical reasons why they'd only have one ship with, you know, 300 plus Marines, if that, and that's including the logistics support, all that kind of stuff on top of the sailors and all the uh, all the basically support assets they've got too to lend us for uh, doing any kind of assistance, whether it's security, maritime operations, you name it. And what was your mission there? You know, were you, why were you sent there and what did they tell you on this little mission you were going off on? So we were originally briefed in the officer's mess, um, the wardroom. They had talked about um, President Obama's family members being there. So there was a SEAL platoon that was going to engage in at least retrieving those people. But our original thing, because Indonesia is the second largest terrorist capital in the world, they do a lot of training out there. They, I mean, there's a lot of uh, Muslim people that live out there. I mean, that's the demographic of religion out there. And not, you know, and not to say that, you know, all Muslims are bad because that's what, you know, media tries to portray these days, trying to fear monger, but that's the typically domain. So if you're looking at, an aspect of where, yes, there's going to be people who are not friends uh, of Americans. They're going to think less of us. They're going to want to harm us. They're going to want to harm some people. That doesn't go to a religious side. That just goes to a personal side of things of what they feel. So because of that reason, every time there's a natural disaster in that area, the enemy likes to try to take over the area. They try to maim, kill, um, you know, whatever it is that they do that is not good. Uh, you, what you could ever picture in your mind, that's what these people like to do. And they're very sick. But at the same time, 
we were there as more of a security element to make sure that some of these shipments that they were dropping supply wise were going to basically be secured because there is a risk of an enemy force coming to that LZ and potentially opening fire. So uh, because of what we were equipped with, such as just M16A4s, because I was a saw gunner, so there's no reason for a saw gunner to go, you know, because that's more of a combat operations compared to just, you know, humanitarian assistance or security. So I was equipped with the M16A4 and all of us were, and that's what we were doing. We got in the bird, they briefed us a little bit, told us, you know, and especially at that time, at being a rank, you know, you're not going to, you're going to basically just follow orders and just say, yes, sir, no, sir, and all that kind of fun stuff and do as you're told. And that's it. And that's what we did was basically provide, try to provide security. And uh, that's when basically things just started to take a turn. Joey's not my name again from Reddit, verifying the events around Michael Herrera's UFO encounter part one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so I would recommend anyone who's interested to read through and, Basically, he's gone through everything that he can corroborate, right? So um, this is from Joey. I've been disheartened by yeah, the attitude of the him. community. Yeah, so quick to dismiss. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, I mean, I'm yeah. thankful that he did what he, was, he has been doing because he's been very helpful and even trying to get information for myself, at least to figure out, um, you know, um, map reading. I mean, things like that, trying to figure out where this exactly happened. Because, I mean, if I was a pilot or if I was somebody who had a map, I could probably point out where but there's only certain things you can do with terrain association, not to mention because this is 14 years later, they could have expanded. There's things that they've done to the city. That area may be, you know, there's a lot of variables at play here. So when I went through my meeting with the Pentagon in April, one of the things that I asked them was, if you guys have the ability to look at map data from 2009 during those uh, particular time frame, then that would have helped. And all I heard was crickets. They have not been able to get back to me on that. I've sent numerous emails to my contact in the Pentagon, and they have not sent me anything, not even an acknowledgement of, hey, we received your email, we'll get back to you. Nothing. And these are all, yeah, so he has in here all the verifiable um, facts, mm -hmm. right? That basically you were on the Denver, you yep. confirmed that the USS Denver was there. Um, it was in the area. Oh, so they, they decommissioned that ship, uh, I think, a couple of years ago, as a matter of fact, and they actually sunk it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So one point he talked about was um, weapons. You know, uh, I guess he inter he did interview other people in your platoon, and they don't Correct. remember having any weapons. Um, no. You know, um, how do you, I guess, how do you respond to that, I guess? Well, because a lot of them weren't on the team that I was on. Um, I wasn't attached to my platoon, per se, just because I was with mess duty, so they basically assigned sticks. So you weren't originally with who you would be with your chain of command. So if, you know, there's a couple of guys that were with me at that point who were also on mess duty that were, could attest to this too, but I'm not, uh, I'm not going to give any identities of who was with me, obviously, just because I'm trying to keep them safe. And they also don't want that information being released out. A lot of them weren't mm. friends uh, or not friends, I should say, but they're not friendly to the idea just because the fact of, um, you know, there's a risk associated with, I mean, there's things that have happened to me even since talking about this kind of stuff and it's been it's been crazy so i don't wish that on them uh some of these guys are still in the military to an extent some of these guys are doing things that are great they got families i just i just have a wife that's about it and uh you know obviously my dad and all that but these guys have kids you know um, a lot more to lose so to speak so i understand cool well yeah so i would just for anyone who's interested or you know, doesn't believe your accounts, I would, you know, uh, recommend they go and check out this this Reddit link, verifying the events, yeah. really, that many of the events around your uh, 2009 Indonesia um, encounter um, can be verified and were verified. And so, yep. yeah, thanks for to Joey for, for doing that. Anyone that has further questions about the, the event can go check it out here. But I'd like to focus on um, this which is just a uh, kind of a, an amazing story. You, you, you mentioned since you made that um, disclosure at the disclosure event, at least publicly 12 June, um, you mentioned uh, these containers and the operations, et cetera. And after that, you had someone contact you. Can you talk about how that went and, and really how you, how you fell into this, how you learned about this? 
So um, this was bef- this was in July. Um, Dr. Greer basically forwarded me a message from somebody that he's been getting information from. And uh, this person has been in this organization. Um, and I don't know the specific name of it for obvious reasons. I mean, what people have to understand is I'm learning as much as everybody else here. And I've said that in every interview, uh, relaying this type of information that they've been giving me. So it's just the same thing as you guys. I'm, I'm also new to this. I'm also learning it. I just hear it directly from the source. And then you guys hear it from me. And I wish hopefully one day if everything boils over and things go as they should, at least as what we plan, maybe he could even explain publicly to an extent of what the actual operations were entailed to that. So uh, July timeframe, I received a message from Dr. Greer from uh, giving me the contact information of this source. And it's a group of individuals that are in this organization. And uh, all he told me was, here's his contact number. Go ahead and reach out to him. He wants to talk to you. So I sat on it for a day because that is something that I never expected to have happen. Hmm. I thought I was just going to go to Washington, D.C. I thought I was going to do Dr. Greer's two-day event. I thought I was going to do the National Press Club. And uh, that was it. You know, they had to rely on some text messages from some of the Marines that were with me, um, which were, you know, the Senate Intelligence Committee has all that information as well, as well as the Special Intelligence Service. So um, this individual uh, had his information and I kept, uh, I kept all the what ifs started playing in my head, you know, um, kind of freaking me out, honestly. So uh, I sat on it for about a day. And then I reached out to him the next uh, the next morning. And I originally called him at first, which usually I just call people and say, hey, you know, like instead of just trying to text, but um, he didn't receive the, or he didn't doesn't have a voicemail. You know, it's kind of odd, but um, I understand why. And then um, I saw him a text message basically saying, hey, it's Mike. Dr. Greer gave me your information. I'm reaching out. To some, I heard there's some things you want to discuss with me. And that's basically when he said um, he he get you know did the introduction of course, and uh, he didn't tell me specifically what his role was, but he told me that he wanted me to come out to area at least out west near there and um, talk about um, you know meeting in person. And uh, originally I thought it was going to be in Colorado, but that wasn't the case because obviously I guess this guy was pretty busy, and I tried to get that to happen, but. I ended up having to go out west, and uh, uh, I met with this guy, and he explained to me, at least through text message, um, the security protocols, because the way that these guys operate, so they have some pretty remarkable stuff as far as for security for myself and any other person involved or anybody that you know they're going to essentially talk to. So they had some very, uh, it may have been overkill to an extent. I'm not going to go public with why, just because I don't want this to lead to anybody specific. Um, but he assured that my safety would be taken hundred percent serious, that nothing would happen. And, uh, that was enough for me to say, okay, you know, uh, when would you like me to come by? And we had scheduled this for the late part of July. And, uh, so I ended up going out to meet him, uh, took a flight out there and, um, you know, um, he had his, uh, he had somebody pick me up from the airport there, um, in that area. And, um, at first, I didn't think much of it. It's just, okay, nice to meet you. You're the driver. Cool. Okay. So we end up leaving the airport, going to the meeting spot. And uh, there, lo and behold, I mean, here's the thing, though, is I've already seen this gentleman when he was in D.C. Because he attended uh, Dr. Greer's event. Uh, and, so you met uh, him in person or before this? I, I talked to him in person before, but it wasn't anything like how it was. He didn't think I knew who he was. Um, I was running security for Dr. Greer along with some other gentleman who um, was really armed. Um, I wasn't, even though I run, I run a private security company. And, you know, it's pretty much easy for me to obtain at least to provide security armed for, you know, VIPs or anything like that. Washington, D.C. is a very different animal in that regard. So you have to open up an LLC there. You have to get all the credentials. You have to go through the courses. I mean, it's, it's a lot of time. A lot of money and uh so it's just easier for dr greer just to get somebody who's already certified and all that stuff to do that so i end up taking dr greer to the green room where he was meeting with this gentleman and this gentleman was explaining to dr greer what basically i saw that's why you know he went there to attend just to see and just provide security as well 
which I didn't know that until coming to find out, you know, later down the road. But um, so I met this person. We just kind of shook hands, say, hey. And he's like, thank you. You know, you, you sounded good up there. You know, like, keep up the good work. You know, this stuff has to get out. You know, I didn't think much of it. I completely didn't look like that type of person, which you would expect. Uh, dressed like a nerd, like somebody at a convention, for, per se. You know, you couldn't pick him out from the, you know, separate from the crowd, so to speak. So he's very good at playing uh, optics with uh, situational awareness. But going back to the meeting, um, so when I met this gentleman, he had pulled out a wand when we went into the secured area. So he rubbed it around himself, you know, all the extremities, and then he handed it to me, and he said, uh, go ahead and, you know, track your whole body with it. It was to check for bugs and check for chips. And um, because some people that, you know, in this organization are all chipped, um, which is kind of weird, but that. That's just how a lot of the subjects that they deal with are also chipped too. So he expressed that um, at a later date, not during the in-person interview. And, um, well, you know, I put my phone on airplane mode um, because when I had it in my pocket and that wand hit it, um, he just told me to go ahead and put it on airplane mode and set it away. So obviously I couldn't record or take photos or nothing like that. And um, he explained in great detail what his uh, role was, how long he's been involved with this, the screening process, how he got us selected to do this. Um, he went in very specific detail personally um, with, you know, how he was able to achieve being onto this team and uh, his first interactions with the team, first couple of missions that they've ever done. And uh, he gave me the whole history of how this organization started from 1947 during the National Securities Act that the president signed at the time. And their specific thing was to basically um, investigate crash retrievals with UFOs, um, basically all the kind of taboo stuff you hear today. Um, and you hear some of the stuff that information that Dr. Greer's been, or not Dr. Will Dr. Greer on top of that, but also David Grush has been talking about the government's type of uh, retrieval team. So you got blue team and then you have the black team, which has a more refined and more perfected version of crash retrievals because they've been doing this since the 1940s. So um, he expressed to me how that integrates with what they were doing. He expressed his sole reasoning, how he knows that they do it. I'm not going to go into detail about it, but uh, like I said, I hope there's a day where I can, because I know basically fill the death dots for people to understand. Um, and um, prior to that meeting, he asked me a very strange question. And I'll never forget this. He asked me if I was a 1911 guy or if I was a Glock guy. I said, you know, well, 1911s are cool, but I like Glocks. You know, I know how to use those. I've used them for, you know, years, especially, you know, doing my own security and all that kind of stuff. Very easy weapon system to maintain. It's like a Honda Civic of pistols, per se. But um, so I said, I like Glocks, you know. So he ended up handing me a Glock, and he, um, you know, he unloaded it, pulled the slide to the rear. He handed it to me and told me to go ahead and load a magazine in and chamber around. And uh, I did that, and I put it in the holster, and he says, go ahead and keep it with you. So I was the only one armed and he, he understood that I was very apprehensive with this meeting to begin with. Um, I couldn't sleep. I was very nervous. I was, you know, I didn't was expected to either get ambushed or, you know, I even left a paper trail with certain people, including Joey is not my name, just in case if anything happened. Um, yeah, it was interesting too. Or, yeah, yeah, if I can cut in just a second is when I met with Joey, um, he talked about that because he, he was investigating your case. He was happy to get, your help actually, you know, he was able to ask you questions directly. Um, but then he was surprised how much information you were telling him. You know, he said he, uh, yeah. he and, and, and he, he started realizing as well that you were going out to this meeting and downloading the information with him. You know, that's where he was getting even more nervous. Right. Um, yeah. and he talked through that cause, uh, and he tracked basically when you were going out there and what, how long you were there and he made, he talk yeah. to you afterwards, et cetera. So, yeah, it's interesting. He was able to verify a lot of these details that you're talking Correct. about through other means that we can't really discuss on this yep. call. But I, but I will say he did verify some other details, a few other kind of key details that you were there, you were in this location, and and some of these things did happen. So it was interesting. Oh, yeah. he, he did uh, verify that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, it it was more the sense like I didn't, you know, uh, my family. I mean, I don't know in as much as they could do because they don't really have a voice online so to speak you know they have um 
you know, Joy's not my name's got a Reddit handle. He's got access to getting stuff out to the public. So my thinking was at that time, if anything happens to me, maybe he could relay that information and, and, you know, at least put the word out that something did happen, you know? Yeah. And um, I had told my dad one point before I went out there was um, we just recently had a, a dog pass away um, at that time. And I told him, I said, I'll call you personally and let you know that I'm okay. I said, but if I ask you the question of, if I ask you the question of how Chester's doing, that is code for saying that everything's not okay and you need to get in touch with the people. I left him a list of names with some telephone numbers in the government um, to basically, you know, tell them where I went. Um, I gave him the information of the contact as far as the phone number and all that, just in case, because again, you know, last interaction with these type of people is getting held up at gunpoint. It's not mm. something they want to have happen again or worse. You know, so my thinking is if I could leave a paper trail and just get people to know that, you know, I'm going out to meet the horse's mouth per se. And uh, one of the members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, I reached out to him and let him know. And he actually sent me a message that was pretty, pretty empowering. And he says, actually, I'm also working with that gentleman that you're meeting with. Okay. I was like, really? Because yes, uh, he's supposed to, um, we're supposed to have an in-person meeting sometime soon, but he's been relaying information for me to understand what you've been dealing with on top of what his involvement is as well. So that made me feel really good because it was, okay, you know, other people are, are talking to this guy. This guy's actually reaching out to people in the government, you know? So I don't, at that point, it's like, okay, if he's only using me to do these kind of things, well, obviously he's not because he's going behind the scenes and talking to some very key people, including Grush, for the matter of fact, too. So um, at that point, after he kind of briefed me on everything that I saw and what the purpose of it was and, and the explanation of it, he asked me, is this, okay, he's like, the next question I have for you, because we have time, he says, uh, do you want to take a helicopter flight out somewhere? I said, sure. You know, and I had kind of talked to Dr. Greer prior, previous to this, you know, um, he kind of gave me a little bit of intel about the situation, but not enough. Um, and I think that was purposefully done because they wanted to see my reaction on how things were. But we ended up going to a uh, black site. And uh, mm -hmm. this black site, which looks abandoned topside, that there's no activity, um, is genius on their part. But underneath the surface is a very, very, very different story. It's a very active spot in certain uh, references. This particular um, site, they do a lot of uh, scalar longitudinal weapon testing or EMPs. This is a very advanced version, but they have different types. They have some that are so surgical that are very accurate, and then they have some that are kind of like a wave. And unfortunately, when uh, the purpose of that facility is to actually take down ET crap. Okay. And they do this about two to three times a year. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, well, I, we, that was way too fast. Okay, so uh, you, you basically get briefed, right? He, he briefs you on the on the historic, how, how the program started. Can you Correct. give any, um, any more details on that? You know, is it, um, you mentioned 1947, uh, yep. the National Security Act. Um, yep. Yeah. Can you go through any any more details that you remember so, on what he briefed? Yeah. Yeah. This this particular group was started more the means of uh, in conjunction with the Air Force. Um, that was kind of their thing. Um, and the person who originally started this group ended up being a very higher high up in in the Air Force, as a matter of fact. And he told me his name. I don't remember the this individual's name who created this group, but. Um, it was very integrated while the while they had special operations doing other things for conventional military. They had another team of special operations that was designated for the press retrieval aspect of it, uh, research and de development, uh, things like that. So while the government is handling stuff that goes towards more war and specifically with uh, defense, this other group's purpose was just basically to research and develop and, and come to an understanding of how where these beings come from, if that, or the kind of technology that they have. So, um, and then throughout the years, because you have so-and-so uh, changing of the guard, if you will, 
because you have, you know, elected officials, they run their cycle and they're retired or they end up passing away because they're from old age. Throughout the years, the knowledge of this organization started to dwindle down. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the key people that was actually got wind of this organization was Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton knew that this operation ex was going on. He wanted more intel on that because he has had other sources at least come to him and tell him some pretty crazy claims. So he wanted to get to the bottom of it and then he was waved off. So um, there, and I can't, I can't go into specifics with what they ended up wanting to do because then would lead back to what these guys are doing present day. But long story short, because changing of the guard, now all of a sudden you have a group that's out there that has some of the most cutting edge technology that humanity could benefit from that anybody will ever see. Um, to them, it's like a normal day at work. You know, uh, he talks about even today when I, uh, when I send him some messages, he thinks transportation is boring. And he's been, you know, he, his uh, involvement with it is just because it's a normal everyday thing for him. It's just like, that's just it. You know, for us outside of that, it's like, wow, like how, how can you not be amazed by this? But this guy's been in this group since the, since, you know, very long time since the nineties. So he's seen quite a bit and granted, you know, there's things that he even doesn't know to an extent because everything is still compartmentalized. It doesn't matter how senior you are in this organization. There's some stuff outside that aspect that you're not going to know about. So um, everything that he's involved with, he's told me personally what he does and how he does it and, and what his role is. And it makes perfect sense in how he would have first hand, first hand account with, with these uh, craft anyway. Um, but the different, but the thing with him on um, listening to how he told me how he can't differentiate between our stuff, man-made and ET. That's kind of the, it's unbelievable. So it means that our stuff that we have is very advanced enough to actually be considered that advanced enough to even replicate ET technology more perfectly than even what I saw in 2009. Um, he's talked about cloaking devices that some of these craft have um, that look even, some of them look more advanced than even some of the ET craft that they've retrieved. So if that gives anybody an idea and granted, I understand how crazy this all sounds, because if I was not in my shoes, I would absolutely say that this is insane. And it is. I'm not going to disagree with that. It's a very hard pill for me to swallow. And uh, subsequently to the meeting, I couldn't sleep for about a week. Hmm. I was nervous. I was I was scared because now all of a sudden I'm talking to these people who do this for a living and, and understanding how psychopathic this organization is and they'll kill anybody they can to keep things quiet and they have and i'm aware of several instances where they've done this and it's something that it may at one point and it's very possible it could bite me in the ass one day but i'd at least would rather take the risk to get information out make this at least public get people in to know about it because if there's enough people to know about this and the people who have the power of the pen or even some law enforcement through the government to do something about it, which they intend to, then maybe this can come topside and maybe humanity can benefit from this once and for all. Maybe the secrecy can just go away and it doesn't have to be taboo anymore. Hmm. You no. Know, so I why still did, have the Why is he coming out? Um, so why is this, did he explain um, why he's taking this risk? Yes, because he wants transparency of it because he doesn't agree with a lot of the stuff that they've done. Um, him personally, along with these other guys that I've spoke to, they were misled. They were misled for a very long time. Um, you know, we're talking about decades, right? So they think that what they're doing is, is you know, for the greater cause of this country, for Department of Defense to keep in our um, national security per se, right? But when you're going and doing things like shooting down ET craft or doing other things that are illegal um, stuff, to my knowledge, at least um, I know he probably has partaken in things like that, but just because he has to, and he has no choice, but at the same time, he wants oversight. A lot of these guys want oversight, but more importantly, these guys want out. They don't want to do this anymore. Now that they, now that the rug has been pulled out from under them, 
they understand what they've been dealing with. They understand that this is a rogue organization. They understand there's very evil people they work with and they deal with on a daily basis. So if they're safe, and that's their number one priority, but they all, also the other priority too is that this group has a stranglehold on people in DC. And I found this out through the source among other instances that he's briefed me in detail, which I will not go into because I can't. Um, a lot of it because I don't know personally because it's not something I could actually speak on because I don't have firsthand knowledge, but from the stuff he has firsthand knowledge on, part of what they're trying to do is at least eliminates to an extent the risk to politicians of wanting to pass various laws and legislations to allow things to happen. And a lot of these guys are scared because when they started basically peeling this onion, so to speak, they started understanding how, how risky this is, how scary it is. Um, the fact that you have people in positions of power that are being told no by groups that essentially would have to listen to them, but they don't. And they privatize things so that way government officials can't look into it. A simple FOIA requesting and going to do it. You know, so understanding the complexity of it, understanding the risks associated with it, I understand it even puts these guys into a very hard place to be because they're in the middle of this damn war. They're in the war of with their, their likelihood, their livelihoods, with their families, with everything like that. And now all of a sudden you have politicians that kind of feel the same way. And now when you start having people kind of meeting at a certain point because they're dealing with the same thing, that's when people start meeting and talking of how to develop plans. And that's what's going on currently as we speak. Uh, a lot of it I don't know personally, but the stuff that I do know, I'm, I was advised and pretty much signed not to tell just because it puts, uh, violates OPSEC, so to speak. Hmm. Okay. So let's go back. Um, did, let's go back. You're, you're basically, um, you're in the meeting conference room. He says, do you want to go in a helicopter? He, he's giving you the Glock. Um, do you know his position in the organization? Do you know what he does I, at this time? I, I do. And I can't, yeah. I can't say, but I okay, do. So you can't say. But is he high up, I guess, or is he? Yes, you know, he is. Been there very, very, yes, he's very senior. Very, very high up there. Okay, excellent. So you're back. You, you go into the helicopter. So you you, you mentioned uh, the helicopter and then the black site. So what, what actually happened? You get in the helicopter and you, you fly out to this black site. Is he flying? Yes. Okay. So there's people there that are flying. Yeah. There's people there that are flying. Yeah. There, I mean, it's not just, there's, it's a group of us. It's not just one. Okay, cool. So you fly out on the helicopter in this group and then, uh, and then what happens, I guess. So what did, what happens at that point at the site? Well, I can't necessarily talk about that, but let's just say, mm -hmm. um, I was able to see things with my own eyes that would basically make people understand that everything crucial to this world is not topside it is underground and that's all i'm going to say about that wow okay Person. so it, yeah. it's an underground base i guess is what i'm i can uh, no comment okay all right well you saw things at this base that um convinced you so you saw with your own eyes things that convinced you that this is all real no comment okay all right. <laughs> but do you think it's real, I guess? What is your take? Yeah. Do you have any, yeah, yeah, what's your confidence level in this man and his stories? Well, uh, beforehand, I mean, because like I said, anybody could be anybody, but with the knowledge I've learned that day, um, it completely changed my life. That's all I can say for right now. At a later point, when all this comes topside, you know, hopefully it does, then if I'm given the green light to talk about it, then I more than will be happy to talk about it. Because I think people should understand that uh, the severity of this, but I think people should understand that what's being kept uh, under everybody's eyes and, and the the secrecy behind all of this. I mean, I think everybody's entitled to a better planet and better resources, and this is the first step to doing it. So it's, it sucks that you have organizations like this, which are global, as a matter of fact, that have access to technologies that could rev revolutionize mankind forever and put us at a level of even consciousness that's even more advanced than what we are now, which means that we'd be even peaceful people, you know? That's that's essentially what I gather from that, and that's what a lot of the proponent that they talk about, at least that they want, is for that to happen. Amazing, so let's talk about what we, what we can talk about then is, 
their plan essentially is is this book. Um, at least that's what we've gotten so far, right? So yes, this, um, this is just a, this is just a chapter, by the way. The actual yeah. book that they have currently being reviewed by Dobser. Um, so Dobser, long story short, um, they submitted this uh, pre-publication, right, to basically get approved, right? And they did this more of a, a sense of trying to put the Department of Defense or anybody in the government into a pickle because they have to respond. Now, the way that they respond to this is going to tell these guys everything that they need to know. Who's involved, or it's going to tell them if they're compromised, it's going to tell them if they don't know anything, it's going to tell them if they redact certain things, and yes, it's true. So there's things that they're doing in order to understand because they there's no poker face with this. It's very brilliant on their part. So this is just a, a, what they handed me, which I've given to you, and Joey's Not My Name also has its copy too. And they have different variations, as a matter of fact, because the copy they released to me has a little bit of subtle differences compared to some other copies like they've given to Dr. Greer, for example. They have subtle differences. It's still the same thing, just words changed a little bit, and the name of the character in that story is not the same as what's in this one. So they did that because they want to track who's released it, and they want to see how far it goes for each copy. So it tells them what's, how, much, how much of it's being circulated. So in this book, this takes place in 2004. And in this book, I mean, it was when I first read this, this is part of the reason why I was I was I couldn't sleep for a week. Yeah. I, I mean, this cha I've read both these chapters and I would say for anyone reading it, it's not um, I mean, it's it's pretty violent. Um, you know, you, it's, you have a pretty sick murder uh, it, in the first in the first chapter. So I would kind yeah. of warn everybody to be mentally prepared. It's not you know, this it, is definitely a. Yeah. I get point. so thinking about this. Um, you know, the first thought I had when I read this, because he handed it to me when I was literally laying in bed, wanting to go to sleep, and then I heard my phone go off. And he started talking to me, so I was, you know, texting him back. And then he sends me this these documentation. He wants me to read everything. So I'm like, okay, now that I've got this information, these documents, I'm like, now my curiosity is gone. This is a good example of careful what you wish for. Yeah. All right. Yeah. In 2004, this particular operation involved very similarly the containers that I saw in 2009, mm -hmm. except this black team was uh, moving these refugees, as they call them, into these containers to transfer them onto into a black site that's in Chihuahua Desert in uh, Mexico. There's a black site out there, and it actually... Um, in the story, as you recall, they had um, instances where these helicopters weren't squawking, the ones that were flying these containers into this facility, right? Yep. And uh, that was kind of the reason why this gentleman was um, propelled to come forward because of the containers that I saw were remarkably similar to what they had at that time. Now, granted, That's there was involved. Yeah, even you were on Sean Ryan, and I used that, that uh, interview of you on the mm -hmm. Sean Ryan podcast. Um, and you were really upset and saying it's yeah. it's uh, human trafficking, and that's the, uh, that's yeah. what honestly motivated you um, even more is that it was human trafficking, and and that's kind of what forced him, or that's why maybe he thought to contact you and say, well, it's not necessarily yeah. exactly what you yep. think, but it was the containers, right? And so that was you know because I hypothesized for years that this was drugs. I mean, it's the only thing that I could think of. I didn't think it would be anything that would be related to people. That's the last thing I'd ever think about, you know, um, but when he explained why, you know, so long story short with this story anyway, this story is just a, so they market this book as a fictional, a historical fiction, but this is really not that. It's really um, them displaying what they've been involved with and what they've done. Now, the full book, on the other hand, has everything they've done for the last 30 years. Okay. So when that so this when that full, Full book comes out, then that's going to be released accordingly to when at least however they see fit. I got to wait for that, just like everybody else who's already read this part. Um, so I have to wait for that too. But in this particular story, one, they had somebody who is a member of Joint Special Operations Command who was escorting some of these refugees. And some member of these black teams, there's three guys that are, came up upon him, 
right? They knew everything about him. They uh, mm -hmm. called him by his first name. They knew everything. They knew all the him. codes. Yeah, that was the big thing for me. So Alex, he's out there. He's he's bringing these 24 women and children refugees they called. Um, and that's when he's basically ambushed. But they know yeah. everything about him by these helicopters and these three men. They end up murdering him. Um, but they know his codes. They know all the code words because you will do some verification. You know, anytime yeah. you contact someone on a radio in the military, you're going to do some sort of code word verification. Often we'd carry like a little grid of letters and numbers, yeah. right? Random grids. I um, forget what they call. But if you have a chance to, to brief with the people, so you're doing the briefing with them, then you can make up your own code words. So that, that was interesting. In this story, there's little details like that because they had made up a code word. Um, kind of like you mentioned there, where you're gonna you're gonna tell your dad, you know, chest how is Chester? They had a code word in in this, and yeah, the the enemy or these guys knew the code word, and they basically just tied him up and, and shot him. Um, yep. but, but what's what's interesting there, you, you talk about um, this whole special message mi missions unit getting taken out, and then chapter two is them at the uh, the Joint Special Operations Command. So effectively, what has happened is their team, so their special missions unit team for joint special operations was was taken out by this rogue team. So a rogue team essentially stole these these refugees um, with these containers, um, put them in, carried the containers by helicopter. So that would mean that would also be why you would use the containers is that you can move people around quickly. And then they use some pretty interesting technology here. So just I took notes. Um, so it was an inside job. They have really good helmets and good comm gear, but otherwise it's all mismatched equipment. It's kind of reminded me of your story uh, in Indonesia. Basically, when you were uh, you were ambushed by very effective, super experienced, you know, middle aged men in black ops, at least equipment that you didn't recognize readily. You recognized a lot of it, I guess, but it's kind of a mismatch of equipment. But they also had advanced uh, helmets, comm gear. And interesting, I noticed, was advanced aiming reticles and augmented laser range finders. I thought that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'll just write down, they also said uh, they checked it, the, the guy out. This is in the story. They checked him out with a small box with a loop antenna. Kind of what you just mentioned, where they had some yeah. sort of wand that went over him, over his whole body, it was just, over his head as well. Uh, I yeah. thought was interesting. Uh, and then they say, yeah, he doesn't have it. So let's go with plan B. That's where they kill him, I guess. Uh, they put the yeah. refugees in a modified shipping container. And that's where the HVAC unit comes in. So you had mentioned when you saw the, the containers, it had this HVAC on it. And that's why you uh, thought it was uh, human trafficking and not uh, weapons, I guess. If, if that's those correct. drugs is what I originally thought. Oh, you like thought vacuum drugs. Oh, to keep it like humidified, I guess, you know, so the yeah, yeah. drugs don't, you know, get ruined or something. Uh, and then that's when the man came and contacted you and said, hey, actually, it's not drugs, it's people. And then yep. that's when you went on the Sean Ryan show and were real and seemed really angry about this. Um, I, I was and I, you know, I, I still am uh, to yeah. an extent. I mean, I have further understanding of why they do what they do. And, I, you know, the first thing I want to tell people, and this may be a first time for a lot of people, because I've already done some interviews where I've explained this. You know, it, it's still people. Um, the element of human, right? Because coming to find out, these black team operators are not at a consciousness level that is superior enough to have access to this advanced technology, what they call AT or ET technology. So because they can't operate this stuff by themselves, it means that they have to have something else to do it for them. Well, that something else to do it for them is going to be these guys who are um, what they call psionics or P3 assets to begin with. P3 stands for psionic predisposition potential, or they dub it P3. And this is a screening program that they use to screen certain people throughout the world um, at a genetic level, from what I understand, that are borderline psychic. Um, and they have the ability to, with help of the black team, with the drugs that they administer with them to boost their consciousness even higher, that they can access this technology pretty easy. So if you think about it this way, option A is gonna be a black team member, option B is going to be a psionic asset, 
Option C is going to be the advanced tech or ET tech. So black team uses a device that hooks and interfaces with the P3 asset. And then that P3 asset goes and hooks up to that advanced ET technology. From that, what it basically does is they can pilot the stuff. They can, uh, they also are engineers with this too. There's a uh, integration with scientists and this goes all the way back to operation paperclip as a matter of fact, where they pull the brightest minds from Germany, um, even people who are developing the cutting edge technology that, you know, they talk about the saucer, the Glocka, as they call it, or even the saucer that they built. A lot of those scientists end up getting tapped from the black team, and that's how they started doing this R&D program. But the difference is, is when they started getting in contact with actual non-human intelligence in their crafts, and they started shooting them down, they, there was basically a mismatch. They, had, they didn't have, a, there was a missing link, if you will. Well, when they figured out that these people exist on Earth, that can relatively accommodate them, um, then that's basically how they solve that problem. So what I, eventually, what I actually witnessed in 2009 was not a drug smuggling operation. It was a recruitment program that they were utilizing, scooping people up from that area. And it could be all their other areas throughout the world because they look for third world countries. And the reason being is because if they take somebody who's not used to the lifestyle of being a P3 asset, where you have everything provided for you, this includes their their families, even if they're children, they, their children get educations, um, they get free medical, they get uh, housing, they get food, they get clean water, they have everything that they could ever need provided for them. The way I was the, um, briefed about this is almost like the United States going to third world countries to look for cheaper means of uh, um, manufacturing, right? Or they pulling, you know, so if they can make le more money in the United States, which means it would cost more money manufacturing, then they go to uh, third world countries for a cheaper labor source, if you will. So they do the same thing. Holy shit balls. I'm in that interview. Yeah, I've known about this for several weeks and just, yeah, it kind of affects, you know, what you think about your worldview. Like he said, when he went to that black ops, that's what changed his life. If you can imagine, it didn't change his life when he saw the the football field wide... <laughs> UFO turns out made by humans and then but speaking out now he's he's getting more information and the corroborating details really does it for me you know when you have these other corroborating details and if that guy's really talking to the Senate Armed Services Committee then that means this information is coming out uh, but yeah imagine that the strength of the organization so in part two yeah stand by it's going to be a it continues. There's more blockbuster stuff. So thanks for watching. It's free to hit the like and the share. So please do that. If you do want to support the channel, I work more than 50 hours a week on this stuff and make less than minimum wage. So I appreciate it. Don't forget about the contest ending this month, UAP Society. If you have an idea how we can get better UAP evidence, then make a video about it. Hashtag UAP Desai. You can go to the Discord to get more information on that. All the links will be in the description. If they aren't, let me know in the comments. Thanks for being here, everybody. Have a great day. Peace.